the world's very first copyright statute, the Statute of Anne, which was enacted in 1710, was expressly stated to be an act for the encouragement of learning. The copyright clause in the US Constitution gives Congress the power to pass laws to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. In Australia, we don't have such a useful guiding statement in our legislation or our constitution. But nonetheless, our copyright tradition has been overwhelmingly utilitarian. Copyright is awarded to maximize social welfare, not because it's seen as a natural right of the creator. The idea is that we grant copyright protection in order to encourage the creation and dissemination of content. And there is a proven and increasingly strong link between those aims and innovative new business models. In the music context, Spotify is the poster child for this right now. How many Spotify users do we have? Oh yeah, just launched in Australia in May last year, so that's pretty impressive. How many of you pay for it? Also really impressive. Three years after it launched in Sweden, 85% of Swedes in the 16 to 25 age group were using it. That's the people most associated with infringement. A separate study uh, across three Scandinavian countries found that over half the people that were previously downloading music illegally stopped doing that once they got access to a music streaming service like Spotify. Music Metric studied BitTorrent usage around the world over 2011-2012. At that time, Spotify was operating in just 12 countries. Now, BitTorrent, we all know, has a lot of non-infringing uses, but it can be a useful proxy for measuring infringement as well. And this study found that of the 10 countries in the world where BitTorrent usage was shrinking fastest, five of them had access to Spotify. Remember, Spotify just in 12 countries at that time. Of the 10 countries where BitTorrent usage was growing fastest, only one of them had access to Spotify. And that was France, ironically, the poster child for three strike style graduated response laws. Now, when it comes to video, Netflix tells a fascinating story as well. We don't have access to Netflix for streaming video in Australia. But in the US, Netflix alone is now responsible for about a third of all peak downstream internet traffic in the US. And that's just Netflix, it's not Hulu, it's not any of the other streaming services that they've got access to, just that one. BitTorrent trails behind with about an 11% market share. In Europe and the Asia Pacific, where there's no equivalent, BitTorrent remains the largest source of internet traffic, video streaming traffic. So we know that the Australian law intends to encourage the creation and dissemination of content. But I wanna ask, is it really optimized right now to achieve those aims? Does it support the widest possible legitimate access to content? Is it encouraging the development of new business models that seek to take advantage of these marvelous technological advances to bring content to people in new ways? So these are the kinds of issues that we're gonna be pondering this next hour. We're very fortunate to have with us today a highly creative, innovative and entrepreneurial panel whose members are gonna be sharing their experiences and insights before we open, hopefully, to some wider discussion. So first up will be Nick Boucher, AKA Adrian from the Bondi Hipsters, AKA Beached Ez, brew. He is a writer, producer, director, and creator of digital content. He's gonna share his experiences about using social networking and non-traditional distribution methods to popularize and to monetize content. Secondly, we've got Tim Parsons, the Chief Innovation Officer at QuickFlix. QuickFlix is a company offering online and mail order movie rental services, filling the, uh, working very hard to fill the gap being left by the disappearing neighborhood video store. He's a former documentary filmmaker, a wannabe future filmmaker, and holds a PhD in aerospace computing. And he'll be sharing some of his experiences regarding the distribution of commercial content in Australia and some of the licensing challenges faced by online distributors. 
Thirdly, we've got Steve Delby, who is the Chief Regulatory Officer at IINet. Now, I think our second largest ISP, is that right, Steve? That'll do. Yeah, yeah we'll take it. <laughs> Steve's been very much involved in the debate over the extent to which ISPs should be obliged to police their users' behaviour, and his company was, of course, on the winning side in the High Court battle over this issue last year. He's got pretty firm views about the link between infringement and the lack of access to legitimate content, which I hope you will have an opportunity to share with us. Now, without the internet, none of our panellists could be doing what they do. So they're really well placed, I think, to tell us how our regulatory framework, which was created in the pre-internet era, is working for them. Thanks so much to all of them for making the time to come and share with us. Now let's hear what Nick has to say. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I feel I'm really out of my league sitting like next to the second largest ISP and an aeronautical engineer and lawyers. And I was introduced as the guy that made like beach as a bro. I'm like, cool. Um, and chip bro. As, yeah, yeah, <laughs> great. That, that makes you feel better. Um, so basically today I am gonna show you the path between, or that I've taken to, you know, in my creations and how they've kind of been able to be monetized and expanded in cross formats, starting online and then going up to TV. Um, and I'll, without further ado, I'll just show the first creation because at the age of 28, I decided to start acting. And this was the first creation with a few of my friends. And it's called Beached Whale. And it actually has no point at all, as you'll see. Can we hear that okay? So that, that's that. And just take note of that little kind of, this little top bar here where it says buy Beached As merchandise. I believe the inclusion of that changed absolutely everything for us. So we're in that really, really fortunate position where we put something online, we were just messing about and it, and it went viral and it was a complete and utter accident as you can see. The, the visual style of that, people commented was like, nah, no, that's like amazing. It's so simple yet really impactful and catchy. That mirrored our technical capacity at the time. We were working <laughs> on Cinema 4D program, which you could basically you know, make Independence Day on. But we used two two-dimensional flat images to kind of be the two characters. So anyway, um, as you saw in that top, top bar, Buy Beached as Merchandise. So it was going quite well. But the second that we put the Buy Beached as Merchandise, everything changed and it was immediate like the establishment with our audience at that time which was it's all very you know watch and share there was nothing really connected as soon as we did that people just went a little bit bonkers for it there was something that occurred in the universe when you establish a financial relationship with your audience even for something as pokey as this that really changed the fate so through cafe press which is just an basically just an online um, store and I might bring this up because I can. We sold hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. 
Um, and this is a time where the US dollar was really, really strong and we actually were charging in US dollars, so it was quite wonderful for us. So we sold stuff like cups and mugs and, and bibs and bags and underpants and we even sold a Beach Daz G-string, <laughs> which is great. So because we were selling so much merchandise through this online store and people were being seen in, with a little you know, whale on their shirt, um, a Supre who you may or may not know um, because you're not between the ages of 9 and 14 and women. <laughs> but basically they came to us and said, look, we want to make a Beach Daz Bro shirt. And I was like, nah, that's so uncool. It's the worst thing that I could possibly do with this brand. But my two other business partners, Anthony McFarlane and Jared Green, creative partners rather, they were like, we should do it. And I was like, okay. Almost as soon as we did that, throughout the 140 stores in Australia and New Zealand, it just went bonkers. To this day, we're the highest selling product through their store ever. They, for the first time, ever released a male line of clothing because the demand was so high. All these dudes came in and were like, yeah, uh, can, I, can we get one of those? And anyway, they tried to reconfigure them for dudes. Anyway, it worked. And we sold over 90,000 shirts to this day through Supre, which I found the most surreal and wonderful thing. So it was around that time, because of the fact that the merchandise was going a little bit bonkers, that ABC came to us and asked if we wanted to expand it. And we were hugely keen to do that, obviously. Uh, and they commissioned 10 by one minute episodes and we did two series of those. And they, they turned out pretty well. In fact, I might show you one because I can. Um, this is about a, essentially, it's a little bit racist actually, I'll be honest. But it's really quite funny, not intentionally. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to skip that. <laughs> Great. Good work. How much did you just get paid, Nick? I just got paid about eight cents. So that's that. Um, so with the ABC, we did the two series, and it was quite a curious thing. Great. Um, <laughs> um, wow, look at that. Anyway, um, so through that, doing the two series, having the original successes that we had, we managed to retain a great deal more control than what another creator would have had had they pitched this concept originally to a TV network and went through the, the standard processes. So we're in a really fortunate position where we own this property still, we own all the underlying rights, we own all these things that previous would, previously wouldn't be possible. So moving on to, to the next thing um, that I created, and this is horrible, and I'll only show a few seconds because I think the real comedy is the fact that I'm showing this here to you guys. But this is a character that I um, had for a little while and it had a fairly, fairly big blow up as well. Hold on two seconds, that's not the original. Just bear with me a tick. There we go. All right, and I just apologize in advance. I'm not this guy. Trip, 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 yeah, fuck that ass, 
Okay, I'm going to spare you any more of that character. But basically, think two minutes more of that with more colourful curse words. But that became this just really accidental, huge hit. And there was a conversation that started quite immediately with the audience. is like, is Trent real or not? Because people were certain that Trent was real. They were like, nah, man, I know him. Like, my brother's, like, hangs with him and stuff. Like, a fool. I know that guy. Nah, he's dead. He got shot. Basically, this conversation was going on from, from point dot. So, instead of making more content, I was like... Man, I'm just kind of going to leave it. I don't want to become that guy as an actor because you could easily become that guy like pretty quickly. Um, so I just kind of left it. And the fact that there was so much conversation taking place that it just fueled the, the black hole, whether it was real or not. Um, and we fueled it. We did two sightings, one where I was in KFC saying pretty similar stuff. <laughs> And then another one when I was just walking down the street and they were sightings. And again, that just kind of fueled that conversation. Um, to this date, how we managed to monetize that, we put up a Cafe Press link at the end of this video and people went berserk for the merchandise. I kind of felt that it wasn't so visually appealing like a little blue cute whale. So I knew that it'd be a fairly finite period of time in which it'd be popular. So maybe we sold for about six months and we're now still ticking over, but, but less so. But what we're doing now with Trent, so Trent's got over 180,000 Facebook fans and we've got quite an, an active audience and occasionally I just write something quite offensive every three months and people are like, genius! <laughs> just like, they can literally move. Um, and that, that audience is still there and they're, they're calling for him and I think that's based on the fact that I didn't do a great deal. Um, and this is a decision again by my co-collaborators, Anthony and Jared. Where we are at the moment is we got offered a... Um, possibly development for a feature film that may happen in 2014, which is quite a curious thing. So going from online, we did not expand it to TV, we hardly expanded online, and now we're in, into feature territory. And we've got an audience of several hundred thousand through YouTube subscribers, Facebook fans, that we can communicate directly to. What we're gonna do to raise part of the money for the film is crowdfund, so you get your audience to essentially donate money toward the film. They can pre-purchase a DVD, a shirt, or I can do something special like turn up to their house and cook them a meal for a little bit more money, or, or whatever I'd do. Um, so that's how we've expanded that particular, particular property. And it's fairly exciting. Like again, as much as I don't want to be that guy, it could be a really interesting <laughs> film in a little while. Um, and then not long after that, I teamed up with a fellow, another creator by the name of Christian Van Vuren, really gifted, talented dude who chose to start acting on the back of getting tuberculosis. It's that old chestnut. Like, <laughs> he was in hospital for seven months and he just started to create and made rap videos online and people connected with him. He was, couldn't do anything for seven months other than work out his Mac. And that gave birth to his artistic career now and he's a phenomenal director, amazing writer, wonderful actor. And that's a, a very good example of, of the power of this, this game that we're playing online. Um, this is one of the first creations I made with Christian. And um, yeah, it's called The Life Organic. And the show's called Bondi Hipsters. Okay, I probably should spare you a bulk of this as well. But this, these characters are just based on those, <laughs> those dudes who purport health but are by far and away a major part of the problem. <laughs> um, so the path to those guys, um, I've got to kind of finish up pretty soon. Um, 
But the path with this particular property is we, we had a little bit of a strategy when going to this. We were like, let's make one episode a week for a year. And we did that. And then through that, because that, there was a, this went viral-ish, but because we were so prolific and reliable with the release, how we released our content, an audience could expect to get an episode every Thursday and we built it thusly. Um, and we also turned down any sponsorship, any kind of network, any, anything for, for that year. We just wanted to build it and not kind of establish a financial relationship. But now we're at a point a year in where we're in development with ABC on a TV show. We've sold our 40 odd episodes online. In fact, 50 odd episodes online, we've sold them to Juice TV in New Zealand and ABC2 here. That's a curious thing, the fact that they're online currently, but we can actually ta rip them offline and sell them to a TV network, which is fairly interesting, um, just given the fact that they're just so hungry for content. Um, and we're now doing a big ad campaign with a brand that I can't mention, which is going to be fairly interesting. We've got a merchandise line coming out. We're doing national DJ tours and so on and so forth. So the path to monetizing this one was a little bit slower, but we just felt that we had to build the audience just with a little bit more care. Um, and I think that's pretty much about it. Um, I hope I didn't waffle too much and offend you horribly with the things that I make. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.